Sophia, thank you for joining us. It's fantastic to have you with us. Um, your distinguished career has seen you work with artists, curate exhibitions and care for collections around the world. But I thought we might start back with your chosen graduate programme at the Centre for Curatorial Studies at Bard College, just to really find out what, you know, decided you to pursue a professional degree in curatorial practice. Well, that's a, uh, I didn't know that I was going to be asked this question, but I'm very happy about it. Uh, I was just talking to a colleague of mine this weekend, uh, pretty much about that. Uh, uh, he studied at the Apple program at the same time that I went to the Center for Curatorial Studies at Bard College. This is in the late 1990s. And uh, we were strolling by Amsterdam, so he was showing me where that building was uh, during the time of his schooling. And I had just met a current uh, student there at the curatorial program. So we began talking about this. And uh, in reality, um, he said, what were your ambitions as a curator at that time? I said, I had no ambitions at that time in terms of a, of a curatorial career. What I was very interested in the 1990s was on site specificity. I had done a workshop in a, an internship at Insight 97, which is a binational public art program that was taking place in uh, San Diego and Tijuana, the border of the United States and Mexico. And at that time, working with artists in public space was a, not only a fascination for me, but was also a, what inspired me to think about how art can take place, even if there's no infrastructure. And so to me, a, what was interesting and why I decided to enroll in a curatorial program was so that I could study exhibition history outside of just the typical museum studies programs. I wanted to know how it was that artists and curators and institutions began programming temporary artwork in public space and the ways in which uh, that brought up a history of public engagement and education and not just arts and museums. Okay, that's fascinating because you have gone on to work very closely with many artists such as Alejandro Cesarco and Sharon Hayes and Pierre Vigue. Um, and in your work for the Biennale de Mercosul, weather permitting, you invited audiences to consider the kind of when, how and why certain artworks and ideas gain or lack visibility at a given moment in time. Um, so just picking up on that idea that you went into a curatorial program to kind of look at these ideas of site specificity. And in a way, we're almost very much back to that with many of our institutions closed during a global pandemic. This seems to be a moment in time that is inviting all of us to reflect on kind of how why and certain artworks might gain a different kind of relevance. Just looking back at the kind of projects that you have worked on, are there ones that you feel, yes, this is something that I now need to draw on again in this particular moment? Yes, and very much. I mean, I think that you've just mentioned the Biennale de Mercosur. And for me, uh, one of the inspirations towards that larger exhibition program was commissioning works in partnership and in a collaboration with companies, universities, and uh, industries that were not necessarily associated to the arts. And at the present, um, for me, it's been very important to think that the uh, exhibitions or education program that we develop at, uh, at our institution in Rotterdam, which is formerly known as Vite de Vite, is that we have to develop working collaboration and there's uh, no other way of being alone, that you have to be and acknowledge the ecosystem at large. So partnerships are essential right now for developing programs. So if one idea is not being a furthered by other partners, then it will likely not reach an audience in the most effective way, whether it's because they won't know about it or they won't be interested in it, or it would be very difficult to engage. So for me, the, the learning of a, a number of projects has been a, to think that a part, developing them in, in partnership is essential and experimentation is at the forefront, a, always what's a, presenting and furthering change. And as a curator, you've had a very strong sense of the need to archive. You have your own website, this and that dot site, and that kind of provides a wonderful overview of the different ways in which a curator operates, which is, you know, through exhibition practice working with collections, sometimes working to support artists, sometimes through theoretical texts. Mm -hmm. um, 
why did you set up that website, um, yeah. Sophia? Thank you for that question. Uh, I have not updated that website in the last couple of years just because I've been so busy in, in working in the institution, but I first began a website uh, in 2008 and it was a blog at that time. And it was a time during my, uh, that blog was uh, set up during a time in which I was working uh, for one year independently. I was between positions and I really wanted to take a kind of sabbatical for myself to really rethink my practice. And writing uh, was essential so that I could share uh, the new knowledge and the experiences that I was having with artists and in projects uh, in the making and in the process of uh, that, just because I didn't have a public space or an institution to be able to share that research or to share those experiences, say through exhibitions and public programming. The website, uh, this and that came later. It on the one hand brings together all the blog posts that I had written between 2008 and up until the launch of that website 10 years later. But it also presents a, an archive of exhibitions and projects. And what I felt was that that website, a, on the one hand, would gather projects that are documented in more personal ways and not only in institutional ways. So it, when you go to an institutional website and you've done an exhibition, it's generally only the professional shots that are presented there and not images about the process, uh, not images that uh, of the installation where a number of decisions take place. And also a, a way in which I could link a, a website that I could link uh, not only those processes towards an exhibition that is perhaps better, better a doc or more professionally documented, but also a way in which I could link those exhibitions to existing projects and texts that I had written more uh, casually through the blog. So that was one of the reasons to be able to, to document them and to relate projects in a different, more personal way. Mm -hmm. uh, but also I would say that a number of the projects uh, in the institutions that I had worked with, and I'll give an example, Art in General, I felt that depending on who ran the institution or who runs institutions, many things just fall into the cracks. And so, for me, it was also important to become responsible of documenting a, and archiving projects on my own and not just depend on the institutions where these were being held a, to do that. So I think that it's just a way to continue and to also make resources available, a, texts, a, as I said, images already, and to have an ongoing conversation. So it's a different way of relating and in this case, it's a very personal website. So it's not a portfolio, nor is it a blog. It's a kind of combination between both. It's a very generous act. Um, and actually, for me, I think a quite important one, exactly because of the fact that it captures something that sometimes happens in curatorial practice, which is that movement between institutions or indeed the independent moments that one might have as an individual curator, but are which still threaded through your kind of lens and ideas. And yet it can be very difficult to capture that in, in, in a moment. So I know that in terms of teaching here in, in UCC in the university, it's a wonderful resource for our students. So really, um, I appreciate it being in the world in that way. Um, but of course, you did go on to work within um, a number of institutions and from 2011 to 2017, you were the curator of contemporary art at the Collection Patricia Phelps at Cisneros, both in Caracas and in New York. And I'm just wondering, how did you approach the different cultural contexts yeah. of this position? That was a, a quite a, a, an amazing experience. I was there for seven years working as a curator of the collection, and I had been working a, previous to that at a museum and a, in Mexico, which is my native country. But... It, when I was invited at the collection, the idea was that I would focus on doing acquisitions uh, for new research and acquisitions of contemporary art for a collection that was very large, and but that had been primarily known for modern art. And so um, I proposed uh, not only just to make acquisitions, I said I would like to do field research to develop those acquisitions by knowing uh, not just what I see in art fairs or magazines or exhibitions in New York, which is where I was living, but instead I want to travel to the countries in Latin America. The Fundación Cisneros mission is to uh, 
show the world the beauties and the knowledge that emerges from Latin America. So they have a geographical focus, which is really huge. Latin America is a, a large part of the Western Hemisphere, as you may know. And, uh, and in, in turn, I said, I, I think that the best acquisitions uh, of, of artworks for the collection will be based on, uh, on field research, on being on site, learning not only about the, how artists make artwork, but the context in which they're making the work. And for that, you need to be not only in their studio, but walk in their city, uh, understand the institutions that they work with or the lack of institutions that are there and be able to understand the value systems and the uh, contributions that their work uh, is making mm -hmm. and so, or referring to. And so the seven years that I was there, um, I uh, developed a, a lot, I did a lot of trips. So I conducted research in, in, uh, in many places and that same research uh, provided uh, the criteria and the uh, identification of the works to acquire for the collection. But it also meant that there was, again, a sheer amount of knowledge and so many new contacts that every trip uh, produced and uh, new ideas, new people. And at that point, which was very early on from my first uh, couple of months at the collection, I said, we have to also focus on uh, education programs and coming together, bringing these networks together and really creating a discourse from a, a local perspective. So we used Caracas. Uh, as a fundamental base of activities for education programs, and specifically uh, once a, an annual seminar that gathered hundreds of people uh, locally, uh, but also connected to hundreds of people internationally in the region to a seminar that focused on a topic and that brought a uh, key specialists from all over the world, but specifically from Latin America. So the research produced a collection or the expansion of a collection of contemporary art. And the uh, research also produced, a, uh, produced so much new knowledge and a shared network in which that knowledge could circulate. So there were a lot of outlets. There was a website as well where we published commissioned texts. There was a participations that we had in different cities, a, but for sure the seminar in Caracas which took place on an annual uh, once a year was relevant and the political situation there and the and the uh, precariousness of uh, the country uh, due to the existing government uh, model that they governance model that they have there is a really really a, you know needing of a uh, connections so the connectivity presented there was essential for that and could I ask you, just in the context of that research, I mean, obviously, you know, we talk about Latin America, but, you know, as you said yourself, as a landmass that is vast in scale, but it is also host to numerous nations and within that regional specificities. Um, how did the collection address or explore that in, in, in and through the research that you did? Um, I mean, did you set them up kind of you know, in, in terms of thinking about the work, did you did you look for thematics or did you kind of guide yourself by the different national, as you say, contexts in which artists were working in? Yeah. So there were a couple of ways in which that was approached and the criteria was set up in different ways. In the collection, eh, Colección Cisneros, eh, as I said, they're eh, mostly known for the modern collection, but among the other collections that they have, including one of eh, the colonial period, a, particularly in Venezuela, but also a one on ethnography. They also have one collection that is quite unique. And that is a collection that focuses on landscapes of Latin America. And those a, paintings primarily are a group of works that were developed from the colonial period. So from the 17th century to, a, to the late 19th, early 20th century. And many of them, particularly by uh, artist explorers from the United Kingdom, from Germany, and from other countries that traveled uh, through the missions or through the commercial enterprise uh, across the Atlantic, and that were commissioned to picture the new world. That collection had been built uh, much many years before I arrived, and one of the former curators of the collection, uh, the Brazilian Paulo Herkenhoff, uh, he had worked in the collection acquiring contemporary art, and he had proposed that that collection of uh, 
colonial and uh, 18th, 19th century paintings also helped determine one specific line of acquisition, which was contemporary landscapes. And that uh, was subdued for many years. And when I arrived there and I looked at it and discussed it with the team, we said, why not uh, approach again that specific focus in the collection and expand it? So many of the acquisitions that were done were uh, from artists, uh, both in Latin America or coming to Latin America to create landscape work uh, there. And of course, contemporary practices are uh, interdisciplinary, so they are not necessarily uh, just purely representational. Most of the work that is done by artists on site or about site involves a uh, research that includes geography studies, political studies, of course, the uh, studies of anthropology and the way in which their work also that is about landscape or using landscape as a backdrop very much speaks to the artistic condition and mobility that artists have in the 21st century, which is very different from the past. So if in the past, uh, many of the commissioned artists that were doing landscape that were commissioned by the states or the aristocracy, in this case, many of the, in today's present, most of the artists working on investigating that uh, legacy of painting or current uh, site-specific uh, geographies and uh, geographical conditions, they were doing it uh, independently. They were either developing this through residency programs or uh, self-motivated by a specific research or character or land primarily of, of their interest. So many works, uh, followed that trajectory of the landscape uh, or artists uh, creating landscapes of Latin America. And some of them were video works. Some of the, I can give you an example of a very beautiful work by Adrian Balseca, an artist from Ecuador. He, for example, developed an artwork based on a General Motors uh, truck. And that was uh, produced uh, in the 1970s uh, in Ecuador and released there. And it was a truck that, uh, you know, General Motors and Ford, many companies had a Volkswagen, they've had different companies manufacturing cars in the, in the Americas. But in this case, General Motors had developed a truck that would move around uh, and come to exemplify the petroleum boom in Ecuador. That truck is no longer uh, available. And of course, uh, Ecuador has had a major shift it in, in its economy, but what the artist did was use that same truck to and remove the gasoline pipe of that truck and create a kind of collective road trip where without the gasoline, he asked for uh, people to help him on the highway to cross this entire highway across, uh, Venezuela, across Ecuador with the help of others. So again, you could see the landscape across the country in Ecuador and the car is mobilized no longer by petrol or gasoline, but instead it is mobilized by cars and people helping push and uh, hail the car throughout the city. So not all the works uh, were not only static, but they also, uh, as I said, uh, brought in other micro histories, economic, political histories in their, their work. So I like that very much. Uh, there were of course other aspects of building the collection and one of them was looking at a younger generation of artists that thought through the lens of participation that was very much promoted during the 1960s and 70s by neo-concrete artists that uh, whose output was primarily a uh, performative but also a uh, through abstraction and so we looked at a uh, artists very well represented in the modern collection uh, which included Elio Tisica and Ligia Clark. And from there, we use the basis that we uh, thought that activation, participation, and performance were essential aspects to include and to look at contemporary art so that we could relate this. So we acquired key works from the 60s and 70s that had not been included in the modern collection because they didn't fit fully the criteria. And by that, I mentioned someone like David Lamelas uh, Maria Teresa Incapié uh, from David Lamelas from Argentina, Incapié from Colombia, and uh, Hector Fuenmayor from Venezuela, artists that 
it had either passed away or were of an older generation whose conceptual work uh, had involved participation was uh, instigating or already a uh, about performance that was later developed by a younger influential to a younger generation of artists that are emerging today and uh, as it respects to the younger generation of artists we were looking at artists that yeah that showed promise and whose uh, work was very serious and uh, who needed to be supported at this time. But the again, acquisitions was only one aspect of my work at the collection. We acquired a, a lot of work. And then advocacy, education were others. Many of the works uh, that were acquired during my time period at the collection have now been uh, donated to a number of museums, uh, public museums uh, internationally. And that was the last two years of my work at the collection was collaborating with museums so that these works could actually form part of public collections. Because that seems to be one of the kind of driving forces of your curatorial practice, Sophia, is this sense of dialogue that is at the heart of how you conceive actually contemporary art practice, so that even in the terms of collection, there's this moment where we're not moving on or building from the past, but actually actively interrogating and kind of thinking about how we can reimagine those constructs that would have shaped the collection itself. Mm -hmm. And now you are the director of um, the organization formerly known as Vita de Vit, and you've come to the end of an incredibly important dialogue um, and a very public process of self-examination in the context, I suppose, of a wider discussion on decolonization in the Netherlands, where you are about to rename your organization as the Constant Institute Melly. Um, I mean, an extraordinary moment to be part of in any institution, but perhaps you could tell us a little bit about this process and how you've led it. Well, it's been, it's all happening right now. It's all in movement. I arrived here to the institution as director in January of 2018. And it was only a couple of months after the institution had made public uh, their decision to rename the institution and to give me the task to do so. So the proposal uh, that I gave at my arrival there was, it seems that the critique that a, that a group of activists and artists are doing here through an open letter to our institution, it's a critique that's based with the fundamental uh, methods and I through and of decolonizing the critique is not based on just the symbolism of, of our name and its relation or connection to a colonial period, uh, which is painful for many communities. So what it also is proposing, or what the suggestion is, is that the institution is run through a set of beliefs and through a set of procedures that are also to be questioned and that are also to a uh, to be uh, reconsidered in that questioning so that they can address or adapt more uh, not only to the present, but also to the immediate communities that make up uh, even our city in Rotterdam and not just the diversity that exists in the world. So the proposal to the team and to the board at that time was that we transform the institution at large and not just change the name. And that the transformation that we would begin would uh, give us or would inform us of what the new name ought to be for the institution. Uh, at that time, it seemed fine. This year, it seemed like, you know, a disaster, like you should have changed it immediately and not, not transform this entire process. And of course, that has to do with the amount of uh, pressures to the institution uh, that we've received uh, since the summer when globally there was a much more, every local movement really a, was reinforced by the, by the global movement a, that has been called Black Lives Matter. So in any case, the movement here locally a, and the decolonizing activities that have been a, set forth in the Netherlands for many years, it's what's really inspired our name change and our institutional transformation. And as part of that, uh, the first steps were to identify what really and how really we could transform progressively and in, in the course of time. And it was very clear that on the one hand, the institution needed to diversify its team. 
so that was one of the ways the team includes not only staff but also board and uh, that meant that new concerns would uh, enter into the discussion of planning so new perspectives new ideas and new concerns that wouldn't have otherwise been considered could now be part of the brainstorming and the planning of our own projects um, Aside to that, it was very clear that the institution had presented for many years a program that presented artists from many different cultures, uh, artists of different uh, countries and races and ethnicities, but at the same time, um, it wasn't the best in how it communicated uh, its program. And by that, I mean it framed it differently, but it also did not really uh, create much effort in just publicizing and outwardly communicating, being more transparent about its processes or its programs, and in that way, engaging the audience uh, more carefully and more caringly, I would say. Uh, and so it was very clear that we needed to have a better strategy and better platform for public engagement. I think that that's the second key thing. And then the third thing, which is uh, quite clear, is that uh, these ideas of transformation had to be uh, more systematic. So there had to be a policy uh, in place, a policy to be developed and in place. Uh, and for that, we needed new stakeholders, meaning we needed to keep our existing stakeholders, but we also needed to broaden the group of stakeholders that we, uh, that we yeah, depend on pretty much uh, for the institution to be relevant and to be uh, taken forward. So on the one hand, a diversification from within and not on the outward list was key. Designing a better strategies and platforms for public engagement. And the third and most relatedly, a maintain and cultivate and create new stakeholders was necessary. So education is at the heart of this because we have to learn in the process so that every decision is informed. Uh, and so that we can also uh, be informative about them uh, to the public. So we design a kind of policy, not a kind of, uh, a real program for collective learning that involve projects at the intersection of uh, arts and education. And the most uh, visible uh, project of these uh, was a platform that was a, the first ground floor gallery that we turned from a typical white cube space into a very dynamic program, event-based driven activity. So art commissions and events every week, it's to be able to free of admission, like to really be able to, uh, you know, lower the threshold and uh, be much more open and vulnerable and certainly a uh, much more accessible to a general audience that may not necessarily only be an art specialist, which was our primary audience for a long time. So that space um, in the last uh, almost three years now has really given uh, our institution uh, you know, the opportunity to transform. We've learned a lot from that, but also it's welcomed uh, the possibility of having new staff. Uh, Jessie Coyman uh, is our curator of collective learning. She's been with us since 2018 and really has been in charge of developing a very strong work program uh, that has brought new audiences. Most recently, we have uh, had two hires there. Last year, it was Heba Soliman, and uh, still today, Vivian Zero. And uh, together with the existing team that had already been there, uh, curatorial and education, it's really strengthened uh, not only the content, but the, uh, the relationship with the audiences and the creation of new stakeholders that we have. And, that space a couple of years ago was named Meli by a group of a young Rotterdamers emerging professionals that participated in an education program called Work Learn. And a, now a, that a process itself and that public engagement of the last couple of years has really inspired a, the new name of the entire institution, <laughs> which is a, a to our surprise, but it's become a yeah, quite a, a loved a name. The name Meli comes from an artwork a, by the artist Ken Lam that has been in our facade for the last 30 years. And a, it only reads, a, it's a text a, that reads Meli Sham hates her job. And it's a text that accompanies an image of Meli Sham who was a student in a, 
in Canada in the 1980s. And it's a very smiley uh, Asian uh, Canadian woman that is just uh, happy. And she's working in a clerical office. And of course, uh, I'm not sure, of course, but the work refers to uh, the required labor that many immigrants have to uh, have to do in order to survive. So they do hate their job, but it is uh, uh, something that they have embraced in order to strengthen the generations to come. So it's a very important uh, billboard in the city of Rotterdam, uh, which has considered itself a very resilient city and a very hardworking city. And, uh, and now uh, that will be our name as of January 27, 2021. <laughs> it's fantastic and a fascinating process and very interesting to hear about um, this kind of idea of almost like a porous institution that you're creating which is in a way more open to different communities and in those public engagements I'm very interested because here in the Glucksman um, that is something that is very very important to us um, to engage with not just our university community but beyond all the communities that might be served by that university um, but it does mean that we don't engage with all our stakeholders in the same way and I wonder if you could speak a little bit to how you might modulate or create the kind of I suppose real relationships that are required to advance that kind of investment from any community in in your work um, mm -hmm. because I think for me one of the most precious resources you you can have or give is time um, because it takes time to to develop very those relationships in a, in a meaningful way, um, but I wonder in terms of your 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 you've actually really dedicated that time. I mean, you gave yourselves. It wasn't just let's change the name, let's make this a process. But as you move into the naming, how will that process continue, and where do you see yourself investing time in relation to those communities? One of the things that we've learned, uh, we've learned many, many things in uh, many areas that we need to improve, but one of the aspects that uh, we really learned is that even if we have the, have dedicated a lot of time to uh, invest in identifying or cultivating or creating new stakeholders, it's very clear that uh, our language has to change and the way in which we communicate has to change. and. That is something that we're still uh, testing, like what is the language that we have to uh, change specifically. Uh, we found out also that maybe we write too much, let alone the type of words that we use, that we write too much and publish uh, much more often than actually face people. And that's exactly not the best strategy uh, uh, also that we've learned uh, that we have to be, yeah, change strategies in, in that regard. One of the ways in which it has been quite relevant in terms of not only engaging stakeholders has been the idea that you do things more often. So before we did like a one grand conference, a couple of important seminars, and for me and for the team, what's been very important is to take into consideration that, that people can become more engaged if they have a, a much more, if we create a kind of ritual, if we create every Friday, we're going to get together, you may choose to come or not, but at least you know that you can count on the idea that every Friday you can engage someone there on the spot. Uh, of course, right now, uh, these last number of months with uh, the pandemic and the social distancing, we have really uh, reconsidered what does this mean? See, if we had spent so, so much time in the last couple of years to uh, make a recurring audience that becomes a node and a stakeholder with us, what do we do now that we can actually gather as often as we could or with so many people as we liked? And we have a, a lot of people there chilling out, hanging out. And those people begin meeting. So it's not about the contents that you produce. It's about the relations that they produce uh, in, in these gatherings. So and the knowledge that those relations, uh, you know, uh, presents as well. Um, so it's really becomes a collective learning exercise. So I think that the question around um, time right now is also one about space. Where do we gather? 
uh, how do we create the continuity? How do we uh, create the, um, you know, the energy for people and the spaces for people to continue sharing together uh, moments uh, in the production of culture? I think that the uh, communication, the recurrence is essential and the modalities in which we, uh, in which we also uh, verbalize or uh, open our expectations to each other. So for example, one of the, one of the aspects that we learned right now in the name change process uh, that was quite actually a request uh, from, a, from the, a number of panels we had five forums and one of the things that was repeated throughout the five forums was that there was a an expectation a, or a request and even a demand that our institution contributes or advocates for historical learning in the Netherlands and about the Netherlands so many of the a, of the pains that have come through and of the controversies that have come through process of decolonizing or that come through processes of addressing a racial difference or a legacies, contested legacies, really a, happen because there's very little knowledge a, about a number of matters that, you know, whether through embarrassment or because of master narratives were not told. So there is a trauma, I would say, that, a, that these a, debates a, present that could be eased if there were, that could be mitigated, could be addressed, could be uh, worked on, uh, if and only there would be a more educational resources there. So the important thing to say this is that if you hear, if you are listening strategically and you notice that there is a demand uh, from your, uh, your audience group, from those seriously engaging with your institution, that's a demand that's repeated like this one for us, the one of historical learning, then you really have to take it on. Meaning that is an expectation that will, uh, that you are being uh, asked to respond to. And I think that stakeholders uh, are not just about uh, what you're doing, how important th uh, they are for your institution, but it's about how important the institution is for them. And I think that a, uh, identifying and maintaining the stakeholders is by being very attentive, not just of like who's coming and what they're saying, but what is the in intent behind what they're saying and what is, if the institution has a leverage, in what ways can the institution leverage a, their voices a, to be amplified and be best heard. You know? So I think that those are things there. It's clear that for us, we have to develop programming around historical learning and that also we have to use any opportunity we can to advocate for example, for curricular reform, right? In education. So that's an example of a, of a, a learning uh, and the relation with, with stakeholders that we've had. That's hugely exciting because I know as a university art museum that one of the things that we are very interested in is how the kind of specificity of contemporary art can enable actually different pathways to learning and different experiences of learning, specifically about the body, because the embodied experience of you know, the encounter with the work of art is a very particular kind of learning. And when you're thinking about um, re-examining histories of trauma, which are often located in bodies and in the treatment of bodies. Um, it is hugely important for audiences to have a different approach to that than maybe the more traditional pedagogical models mm -hmm. that we would have. So I, I know that it is something that we're also uh, very interested in and explore here in the Glucksman. So we will keep talking about that, Sophia. So a huge thanks for your time today and for enabling us to do this pre-record. We're going to move back now to the live questions section and invite in our audience to um, ask you some questions themselves. Thank you so much as well.
There's a question or two coming in on the chat, but before I go to that, I did just want to ask you um, about an exhibition that you have on, I think, in your institution at the moment by Christian Vink that I understand that you co-curated, um, which not only addresses the artist's own experience of migration, I mean, he was born in Venezuela, but now lives in Madrid, but also the intersectionality of Dutch and Spanish heritage that culturally inform part the, you know, that part of the Caribbean where he grew up. And I wonder, you know, because obviously we'd spoken about that idea how about how art as a spatial experience can simultaneously incorporate diverse histories, you know, potentially both the dominant, but also bringing in these other vernacular and um, oral modes into the kind of overall uh, experience of a work. Um, is this exhibition part of that kind of historical learning that you were speaking about that your institution might facilitate? That is correct. Uh, thanks for that question. And um, that is very correct. Christian Vink is someone that uh, is an artist that grew up and uh, in Maracaibo. Maracaibo is in the north of Venezuela, and that's very much uh, connected to the Dutch Antilles, specifically to Curaçao, and not only because of the proximity, but also because of the constant trade and movement. His family is part Dutch, uh, precisely because of that. So he's Dutch Venezuelan. He is, is someone that has been painting for many years. He considers himself a less of a visual artist and more, much more of a storyteller, I would say, a collector of stories. And for him, painting has been a way to a, visualize a number of the oral narratives and forgotten narratives that are not the master histories, but the things that actually make up culture. The exhibition right now that is on view at our institution it involves more than 200 paintings. It's really wow. dense. And a number of the works there is an entire series of works that is a kind of alternative history to a aviation in Latin America. And he focuses a, quite specifically in identifying people a, that are pilots or self-trained pilots in most of the cases whether it was a, a baseball player or whether it was a, a, a former, a, a woman that was studying a, anthropology and that had been a, in a family that allowed her to take pilot lessons and the ways in which they contribute to the exchange or the awareness of our geography and political problems. So whether it is a, using the skills of flying to go take a food a, for an emergency cause in Nicaragua or it is actually a, a flight that discovers the Nazca lines in Peru. So all this alternative history of aviation, which is not a, which is loose a, narratives here and there, and that involves characters that of course are also involved in military coups or drug a, cartels and such, gives you a sense of the region and the connectedness or the separation in a different way. Christian has been uh, most lately quite focused in also understanding his own heritage and uh, the ways in which a uh, colonial history is part of each and everyone through uh, the genealogy, through biologies and through other forms of history, through the immigration of form and also of people. And so he does that uh, also by looking at archives that are forgotten. And I think that it's not just a anecdotes or a urban legends, but are also archival work a, that he does and that he brings together a, to, to, develop, to develop in his paintings. So much storytelling and less of an interest to a, yeah, very, a, very passionate, a, less of an interest to speak to a, say other technologies, a, whether it's video work and such, and to work more immediately with the materials at hand and with something that the hand itself can actually produce uh, as writing. Yeah. Fantastic. Um, and actually just in, in terms of that, we have a question um, that relates to painting about, do you think that landscape is always political or can it be used expressionistically um, as in the pictorial tradition? And um, this is from Helen Horgan, who's also wondering um, how could you be a practitioner interested in the genre? Could they educate themselves so as not to treat landscape superficially without having to engage directly with the politics of every site? Yeah, so. um, it's a very interesting question. And it's a question that we thought very much at the collection. Uh, 
And it's a question we organized a, in fact, a seminar called a decolonizing landscape that was about five years ago in the context of the seminarios, uh, the Cisnero seminars that were taking place in Venezuela, because that was a driving question throughout us. I mean, the history of landscape uh, as a pictorial, uh, yeah, uh, through painting, but also as a, yeah, as a pictorial genre practice has been something that by and large a, uh, has been written through the Western canon and that has been commissioned a uh, by and large also through the uh, through expeditions of course it is a, an, an expressionistic gesture as well meaning uh, we do look at a uh, at landscape and represent it with photography as well I mean look at the amount of Instagrams that there are also of sundowns and this has to do with the way in which we relate with time but it's very difficult, I would say, that within the history of the fine arts to disassociate the politics embedded in the landscape. And I think that many of the artists that are very well known, whether that's Turner eh, or eh, you know, any other artist eh, that is most present, and I would say Eduardo Navarro, for example, that has been looking into the volcanoes in Ecuador and others, it's very unlikely that the work wouldn't be political. Landscape is about uh, the scope of seeing, the perspective that we can have. And, uh, and I just find that, uh, yeah, it's just difficult to disassociate the, if the very interpretation, let alone the practice of, of making a pictorial a depictions of landscapes. Thank you. Um, we have another question now, this time from our colleague Matt Packer, who's the director of EVA International Ireland's Biennial. Um, and he's just interested to know how you consider your work as director at Vita de Vit, or the institution formerly known as Vita de Vit, and the structural changes you're bringing about as an extension of your curatorial work and practice. So he's asking from working with artists, archives and situations as a curator through to working with institutional structures and stakeholders as a director. Do you see or feel this as a continuity or does it represent a more definitive shift in priorities? There is a definite shift in priorities, and I would say that uh, that comes about with a larger policy questions that have to do with diversity and inclusivity and certainly with fair practice. I think that as a curator, a, one, is a, one can be very responsible throughout, but a lot of the decision makings, a, which is a, helps shape a program of activities, a lot of the decision making uh, really has to consider more profoundly uh, other aspects of human resources and political issues that are at stake beyond uh, the infrastructure of the institution. Mm -hmm. So I think that the uh, that what has been very important for me has been to balance uh, my interest in the artistic direction of the program and take into account also the the specific needs of our time to be accountable to some of the uh, pressing issues of the time, for example, the one of equality or the one of uh, anti-racism. Mm -hmm. So I don't think that as a curator, you can do very meaningful exhibitions and structure them that way, but I don't think that uh, ever before uh, I had had a, I mean, I think that the context is very specific, but that ever before I had had to think much more profoundly of uh, balancing that artistic vision with a with policies that yeah that are invested in in interpersonal relations and i think that one of the constant discussions that i find myself engaged with other peers is the one of a emotional labor that a people in the arts specifically where the issue is representation and the work is about representation as well is is being addressed so i think that that's something that a, not even, I would say, leaders in the arts before had had to deal with something a, as, a, as articulated as emotional labor today. We thought about emotions as something that is expressed in artworks or that audiences may feel in their experience, in their aesthetic experience, or that, that you would a, you know, analyze it a, through the very practice of artistic production. And now it's something that is pretty much embedded in the decision making and the uh, and the aspects of equality, labor, balance that are part of any institution. So I think that the shift in priorities has uh, definitely been one that has had to give much more attention into interpersonal relations that are beyond the ones of artists, critics, arts professionals, and certainly the ones that have to do with uh, the political stakes of uh, one's decision-making and 
that's one. I would say that the second one is that I also think that in in an institution as politicized as ours at present because of the name change, there is a lot of uh, expectations that I think uh, are for good reason. And those expectations have to do with helping uh, create political change. And I've always been weary about the instrumentalization of the arts in that regards, but there's one specific uh, task that I think is relevant. And that is one that has been asked of us uh, through the public input phase, which is the one of advocating uh, for education curricular reform. It's to include a, a much more diversified or multivocal history about a uh, colonial Dutch uh, legacies. And I think that in that regards, yes, in, in the arts, uh, we, uh, for better or worse, we tend to be uh, interacting with people in positions of power. Uh, we're not only decision makers, but we're also speaking to a number of decision makers, policy makers, educators uh, that actually have the, um, yeah, have the power and have the infrastructure themselves to uh, develop a structural change also within their institutions as it pertains to the research and the writing and the publication and the teaching of a much more diversified history. So I have taken that uh, or the team and specifically in my roles, I have taken that with much seriousness. And I think that that's a, a very significant shift as, as well, because lobbying with council uh, and politicians is not exactly uh, within my uh, <laughs> previous professional background and certainly not something that I thought I would have to be doing for something that is beyond uh, the artistic direction of, a, of an exhibition program or an education program that's at the intersection of, of arts. Thank you so much for that really considered response. I know that um, I really appreciate it. Um, we're just, we've time for just two last questions. One um, from the curator Porik Moore, who's wondering how the ongoing COVID-19 crisis may have changed how you think about making exhibitions or reaching publics. Yeah, it has changed significantly. Um, there's uh, a couple of things that I will say. One, um, we had already in writing our new policy for the next four years, we had already considered uh, through this idea of emotional labor and the amount of investment that, uh, that experimentation takes, we had already considered that exhibitions had to be longer, they had to be less. Right now with COVID, that's not just one a, you know, a conceptual decision. I think that it also has to do with the fact that uh, audiences uh, are trickling in uh, less and less, uh, uh, less often and with more precaution to the programs, which means that the investment that we do uh, in presenting the work of artists and the themes and research that we've done needs a more exposure, more time for exposure so that there could be really contact there. So that's one, exhibitions will be longer and we will be doing less of them. In terms of the direct impact to our pursuits for inclusivity, uh, one of the aspects that we had uh, devised was that creating recurring programs, small but very, uh, very recurring programs. So every Friday there was one program, almost every Saturday as well, was a way in which we could create familiarity and, and more openness. And now, and it, it worked, we began having a much more diversified audience, an audience that was feeling much more safe in the space. And we have a all that work suddenly feels lost. Uh, and we cannot do things as recurring nor in person. And so questions uh, around inclusivity or, uh, or respect, uh, respecting different positions have to be dealt in a different way. So we have dealt that in a couple of ways. One of them is creating a more a deeper engaged and longer engagements with schools on the one hand. Uh, so more, uh, not many, visitors, but few, but more in-depth uh, discussion. We have continued creating programs uh, that uh, bring education and entertainment to the fore. Some of, the, uh, of these are not uh, live events, such as this Q&A, but are pre-recorded, like the one that we just had. And uh, we have created a number of activities now that uh, were for artworks in the exhibitions and activities that you could ac actually do at home. That's something that we're going to continue because they became very popular. You can download them as PDFs. And uh, these, uh, in the end, uh, are activities that are intergenerational. 
and uh, and those are definitely things that, that we will do. So a lot of content and activities that you can make with your own friends at home without being on site at the galleries. So I think that that's one, and certainly uh, in terms of, uh, that's just in terms of reaching the public, we are gonna change our, uh, our communication style, our communication language, and certainly we're reconsidering the platforms that we use. When will we do postal mail, uh, social media and such? So everything is, is reconsidered. The language will definitely change. And, um, and just one final question, Sophia, which kind of, I suppose, builds on this idea of you've spoken a bit about how you're going to bring people um, through both your institutional changes and also now this kind of additional layer that COVID has brought. But um, Mary Kremen, who's the director of the Void Gallery in Derry, was just also wondering, has there been much resistance within the institution to the kind of systemic changes that you're um, bringing about? I would say that uh, it's a very interesting question. And when, not now, in fact, uh, the first year that I arrived, I think that, that, that was a, there were two cultural shifts. One of them was that I arrived at an institution that had really been through six months of a lot of public critique with the decision of changing a name mm -hmm. and with uh, no one really uh, holding up to the responsibility. Uh, so it was an institution that it uh, was also, uh, yeah, not understanding that the work that had been done for 30 years, almost 30 years at that point, uh, had been in vain, that the, that the demands were something that, you know, had a, a symbolic value that, that was not there. So I arrived at, at a time at the institution that was feeling very, very vulnerable. And so when I arrived, I was coming really from New York, from having lived there for many years. And the work culture in New York is very different than the Dutch. <laughs> and so I think that the resistance uh, at the start of my arrival had to do with, with a, a working culture that is, is extremely intensified and driven in a kind of the role of the leader uh, in New York is, uh, is very directive. I would even say it's very executive, very dictatorial in that sense. And here in the Netherlands, uh, uh, the, the working culture and the decision-making ma culture is based on, uh, on a conversation and consensus-based uh, you know, process. And so I think that there was a lot of resistance at first there uh, in terms of the, pr the, the way in which the processes were handling. That has shifted over the last couple of years on the one hand, because uh, people, uh, our team is really very proud of the changes that we have collectively been doing. We organized differently. There was a lot of um, ways in which uh, rotating task forces for different initiatives uh, were set up. And at first uh, they had lack of clarity because it was very experimental, but right now they uh, they are very clear, but at, st at the still time very dynamic. So there is a little to no resistance. There's a lot of questioning, which is very positive, but everyone is is on the move. In fact, uh, there was a moment also of like, why don't we change the name now? Uh, and I think that that's where you could feel the tension again uh, back in June. But yeah, I think that the resistance was at the start, and right now everyone. Uh, is so uh, collaborative and so uh, so proud of the changes and vulnerability has been there for the last three years, but we have learned to own that vulnerability and to do something with it. And uh, to think more sensibly about how we set up partnerships to, yeah, it's just uh, to support each other in different ways and, and such. Sophia, thank you so much. Um, I just have to say from a personal perspective, your work is so inspiring. And I think partly that's because of your own generosity and in constantly interweaving, you know, your, your, your curatorial histories and experience with these kind of institutional challenges that we necessarily encounter as directors of always complex institutions. So thank you so much for being with us today. And I can see here in the chat, everyone is just so thrilled. Thank you so much. Um, people are just delighted. So really, we, we appreciate it. We look forward to visiting Kunst Institute Melli once we get moving again and um, we very much hope to have an opportunity in 2021 or beyond to welcome you to the Glucksman and to Cork and to Ireland. But for now, thank you so much, Sophia.
Thank you, Fiona. I, I would really like to continue this conversation also to see what we could say uh, collaborating together. And the truth is that people are saying that and I, and I do agree. Your questions are wonderful. The preparation was uh, impeccable. And from the first meeting and this one, uh, they're very, they're questions that are very original and so thoughtful. So thank you so much uh, for this engagement. And I hope that we continue engaging in other ways uh, and engaging the public in both of our institutions uh, so uniquely as you have done with this program. So thanks. Thank you. Thank you everyone for joining us. Thank you. Thank you for the audience as well.